Nick and I were speaking as we were walking into the room, and this really should be in a time when there is a lot of discussion about China that has very little basis in data and fact. This book should be required reading so that there can be a basis in data and fact. It is, I've been waiting for a long time for this book to come out because it's really, it's time that we have the discussion of what's really going on in China, what's really going on in China's economy, and why things are off track, and what should be done to get them on track. Now, if Jan were here, she would say, well, you love the book so much because you agree with it. <laughs> well, I agree with it, but I also think that it, it, it's, it's data-based, and it's just consistent with what I've seen anecdotally in China over these years, that the shift away from having the market being the determining factor in the economy to having government and the state being the determining factor is creating so much friction that we're seeing this slowdown in growth and lots of impediments. But it's a, uh, for a book on the economy, it's actually a great read. <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it, it's not that long. And actually, it's a, it's a good, you can read it in one sitting. Um, and it's, it's, um, it really is terrific because it really does put, give you the foundation for understanding what is going on um, in China's economy today. Uh, Nick, we all know, is the vice chairman of the committee and is one of America's leading experts on China's economy. And he is whom I turn to when I have questions on China's economy. So welcome. Uh, you'll talk for, what, 20, 30 minutes, and okay. then we'll, we'll have a discussion where I will not praise everything. So let me turn it over to Nick. Good. Well, thank you, Steve, and thanks to the committee, and Margo in particular, who I, uh, worked with me to get this all set up and get the books and everything. Uh, uh, as Steve's already indicated, a lot of my work on China over the years has been very empirically based. I don't like to voice opinions that don't have some foundation in uh, in fact, and so I'll lead you through some of the things that I looked at. But I'm going to review just quickly at the beginning. Some of you will remember my previous book was Markets Over Mao and described the rise of China's uh, market-driven economy. Uh, basically, I looked at four or five different things. Uh, there was, first of all, there was price reform, a very substantial change in uh, in pricing, the share of market determined prices increased dramatically after 1978. We had a legal changes in the legal system that allowed the creation and operation of private firms, which was not possible at the beginning of the reform period. We had a very substantial increase <coughs> over time in the flow of credit to private companies by 2010, 11, 12. Uh, more than half of all the new lending from the banking system was going to private companies, and the share that was going to state companies was down uh, to about 30 percent. And we had a very rapid increase in the exports of private companies, and the share of exports produced by state companies went from 60, 70 percent down to around 10 percent. So that was the kind of evidence that I was looking at to make the argument that the most of the growth in China after 1978, most, most of the growth of output, most of the growth of employment was due to the rise of the uh, private sector. So before uh, 2011, private investment was growing extremely rapidly and uh, state investment was slowing down. The share of investment uh, by the state uh, declined uh, quite dramatically. Uh, but after around 2011-12, it started to, uh, the private share slowed down. Uh, this is the history about the legalization of private firms. Here's what I was telling you about credit flows to the private sector, uh, more than half going uh, to private firms by the early part of the decade. And this is the slide on investment that I was talking about, that you can see private, private investment was growing very rapidly and the share of state investment was coming down. and also the share of industrial output coming out of state firms was steadily uh, declining from 1978 on. And this is the export slide. Now, 
<clears throat> what I really want to spend most of the time talking about is this idea about the rollback of market-oriented reform, or, or what, what the book uh, title is, the, the State Strikes Back. And of course, um, it could really be titled The Party Strikes Back, but I decided to focus. They're inseparable in many respects. So what's happening? Credit flows have changed dramatically. The share of investment undertaken by state and private companies is reversed. Uh, there's been also a reversal in the growth pattern in the industrial sector, and we've had a lot of what I call anti-competitive mergers in the state sector. So here's the data on the lending. As you can see, the share of flow of bank loans to private companies, which had been above 50 percent, has now declined, and these data come out with a very long lag, so I can't do any better. But by 2016, the share going to private companies was down to 11 percent. Wow. Uh, and as their share declined, there were firms like Steve's, microfinance companies, P2P lenders, and so forth. I think private companies began to get more resources from that kind of non-bank financial institutions. But now in the last couple of years, that too has been squeezed quite dramatically. So <coughs> the, the financial situation of private firms is much, much less favorable uh, than it had been. Well, if their access to credit goes down, it's now no surprise their share of investment also goes down. You can see the, the da dash line is the state investment, and it's been going up very dramatically since uh, 2015. The private share has come down. The state has also taken away investment from collective firms. Their share has gone down. Uh, foreign firm uh, share of investment has also gone down. So uh, this is reflecting the resurgence of the state. Then in the industrial sector, for a long, long time, indeed I think all the way back to the late 70s, private firms were growing twice as fast on average uh, compared to state firms. That was underlying that diagram I showed you earlier where the share of state industrial output was going down. But as you can see, starting around uh, 2015, uh, the state bottomed out and has now recovered uh, in terms of its growth in the private sector is declining. So now the last two years are the first years ever that private industrial <laughs> output is growing more slowly than the output <coughs> from state firms. Uh, this is in part because of squeezing out, what I call squeezing out, lack of access uh, to credit, and I think also possibly, although it's difficult to demonstrate empirically, uh, you know, some loss of confidence uh, on the part of the private sector. Uh, there were a number of very well publicized cases where private entrepreneurs had their uh, businesses expropriated, as some were charged with various crimes uh, that have since, in some cases, been uh, shown to be falsely convicted and they've been released from jail. Uh, so there was, and the party has talked a lot about the need to improve the protection of private property rights, but I'm not sure how much traction they're getting on that. But in any case, now we're in a, an environment uh, for the first time in the reform period where state firms in the industrial sector are growing more rapidly than uh, private firms. Now the last piece of evidence is, uh, as I mentioned, non-competitive mergers. Remember SASIC, uh, State-Owned Asset Administration and Supervision Commission was created back, back in 2003-04, and they started, they started out with about 196 big companies. Many of these companies, of course, are gigantic. Some of them have more than 100 subsidiaries. And what they have done, I think in part in response to Xi Jinping's uh, repeated statement that state enterprises must be bigger, is that they have merged them. And as you can see just from glancing down this list, uh, the mergers reaccelerated in around 2015. There had been a little bit of a suspension. But these mergers are basically mostly occurring within a particular industry. So you can see uh, shipbuilding, the rail companies, the min metals, and the metallurgical group. So my view is that this, these are anti-competitive mergers. China does have an anti-monopoly law, but if you're a big SAS, so these are what I call top-down mergers. SASIC is moving the chess pieces around the board. Uh, now we have roughly, I can't remember the exact, something like 93 <laughs> companies under SASIC, but nothing's left. They've just been reorganized into bigger companies. Now my view, is that this is, has been anti-competitive. It has led to uh, a decline in productivity. There's less incentive once you get a more monopolistic market structure. Uh, 
there's less incentive for controlling costs, uh, there's less incentive for innovation, there's, you know, partially because there's less competition. So let's look and see what happened. So I'm not sure you can see this in the back of the room, but the takeaway here is that the assets of these companies went from a little under 11 trillion uh, before the global financial crisis to about 55 trillion by the end of 2017. So already you can see if you went from 200 <coughs> companies to less than 100, you know, the average company now has assets 10 times what they had at the beginning. The companies are massively bigger. Well, what's happened to productivity? We measure that by return on assets, and as you can see, uh, at the beginning, the, you know, it was in the neighborhood of 6 to 7 percent, some year-to-year -year variation, but as these mergers occurred, the productivity of these firms declined very substantially, down to an average of about 2.5 percent in 15, 16, and 17. This is a very, very low return on assets. So they've gone from 10 to 55 trillion. How did they get there? Well, you can't do the math, but there are the profit numbers. If all these firms paid the 25 percent corporate income tax and they reinvested all their profits, they would have been able to finance about one-fifth, 20 percent of the expansion of their assets. So what has been happening, even as their productivity has been steadily declining, their access to funds external to the firm, that is bank loans, issuing bonds, perhaps issuing additional equity, has been massive. That's financed 80 percent of the expansion of these companies. So I think it's a really an indicator of the power that Xi Jinping had when he keeps talking about making companies bigger. SASIC has certainly succeeded in making their companies much bigger. Uh, I was at the Boao Forum last year and the chairman of SASIC was on a panel and mm -hmm. all he wanted to talk about is how big all the companies were that were under SASIC. And he was bragging, we had revenue last year of 26 trillion RMB. Uh, last year, so he was giving the numbers for 2017, it's now up to 29 trillion RMB. Uh, well, if you have unlimited access to capital and you don't care what your returns are, it's pretty easy to grow top line revenue. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what they talk about. So he was talking about how these companies can compete internationally, they're so big. Well, they really can't compete internationally because they're, quite frankly, extremely, uh, extremely inefficient. So, uh, you know, in Washington, Nick, the most rapid increase occurred in the Hu Jintao era, not in the Xi Jinping era. In, in assets that or profits? In, in assets. I'm just, mm -hmm. it's the assets that I'm looking at. So you've got almost during the Hu Jintao era, it's about 350 percent increase in, in uh, seven years, and in the Xi Jinping era, less than a hundred percent increase. In absolute dollars, it's huge, but in terms of percentages, it was much greater in the Of course, it's a much bigger base, so you can't probably grow by 350 percent. Uh, but, but the key thing is that productivity has pretty steadily uh, declined. Uh, some, some variation year to year, but it is a pretty rapid decline. And uh, uh, if you were a CEO of any listed company in the United States, you would not be wanting to tell your board that your return on assets had gone from 7 to percent to 2.5 percent over a period of, of 10 or 12 years. So uh, I think this is one of, of the examples, a very good example. And by the way, I sometimes show these data from to people from coming to the Peterson Institute in Washington, people from the NDRC, and their initial reaction always is, how did you estimate this data? It's actually all published in the SASIC yearbook. You know, chapter two has the data on profits, and chapter four has the data on assets, and I tell them, I used a very complicated estimation technique. It's called division. <laughs> <laughs> to come up with the, the return on assets. So, um, I, I think this is an example of how industrial policy in China is not necessarily guaranteed to be a smashing success. And I was starting to say a lot of people in Washington think that China is going to succeed across the board in everything that was ever mentioned 
in the Made in China 2025 program? I say, well, maybe. But um, it, it doesn't look very likely based on, based on this. Finally, one last um, <coughs> indicator. We don't have very good data on the profitability of private service sector firms. So this is a comparison just looking at the industrial sector. And the takeaway from this diagram, remember the Zhurongji reforms in the late 90s. They got rid of some of the le least efficient state companies. There was a lot of downsizing. And the profitability of state companies, which had been extremely low, steadily increased, began to converge towards the level of profitability of private companies. And that was a result of the downsizing, the reforms that increased competition as China came into the WTO, lowered tariffs as they did in the steadily in the 90s to qualify for membership. But since the global financial crisis, there's been a huge divergence. And yes, private companies' returns also declined, but if you look at the end point for 2016 for private companies, it's actually above where it was in 2017. So they're in a slightly stronger position, excuse me, 2007. But this, the state companies are down by about, uh, about two-thirds compared to where they were prior to the global financial crisis. So the state sector, and this is one of the main arguments of the book, the state sector has become a big drag on China's economic uh, growth. I'm, I'm rejecting the, you know, the idea of, you know, that has been popularized by Larry Summers, that's inevitable reversion to the mean. China's going to grow at 2% per year because that's what all countries, if you look at a lot of historical data, uh, that's, uh, that's the standard pattern. They've already grown faster than anyone else for a longer period of time, so we shouldn't be surprised if they slow down. This is a paper that he wrote that was published in 2014. Well, my view is that, <coughs> first of all, if state companies had followed the productivity path of private companies from 2007 to 2015, China would have been growing about two percentage points more rapidly than it actually grew. And I think that potential is still there. If they went back to a reform-oriented path, if they had a more efficient allocation of capital, uh, and I go into this in the book, you can read about it, if they had uh, allowed really market-oriented merger and acquisition activities so more efficient companies could take over some of the underperforming assets of state companies, if you had a serious bankruptcy law, uh, that you could, uh, China going forward I think could grow at more than 8% uh, for at least another decade. Uh, and I say that in part because China's level of per capita income, even though we always focus on the aggregate, in per capita terms measured at international prices, they're only at roughly 25% of the U.S. level. That's the level from which Japan, South Korea, Taiwan uh, launched their periods of rapid economic growth for a couple of decades, and when they finished, they were between 50 and 70% of the U.S. level. So this is the potential of convergence which I think is still there for China, but not on the current path where the resources are being allocated increasingly to the least, uh, the least efficient firms. So the, the rollback on reform is dragging down growth. Um, and here's what I said, the potential, there is potential for more rapid growth if, if Xi Jinping would go back to the reform-oriented path, the path that was very clearly outlined at the third plenum in November of, of 2013, a document which we were all told he had personally scrubbed and agreed with, and it seemed plausible because he had been party secretary in very market-oriented, private-oriented uh, provinces, but when he came into office, I mean, after he'd been in office for a year or so, he uh, seemed to be preoccupied with his um, anti-corruption campaign and was rather slow on implementing um, the reforms that were outlined in that uh, third plenum document. So uh, the conclusion I, I draw is that she probably understands that his approach is slowing down China's economic growth, but he believes that a bigger uh, state sector gives him more control. And as we know, Xi Jinping talks about control quite a bit. The party must control everything, everywhere, all the time. <coughs> 
And so there's a trade-off between uh, efficiency with a more market-oriented approach and control with a more statist approach. And I think he's way, way over on the statist uh, end, where the state has a much larger role in the allocation of resources, whether it's made in China 2025 and, and many of the other industrial policies that have been pursued, and particularly the massive misallocation of credit. So t unless something happens that Xi Jinping decides he can uh, do with a little bit less control, I think they're on this path. I'm not, I don't forecast that um, they're going to go back to reform, but I do think it's an open question, and that's why I have a question mark at the end of the uh, subtitle. I'm not proclaiming it's the end of reform, but uh, it certainly has uh, reversed in many important dimensions over the last uh, six or seven years. I think that's it. How does the U.S. Uh, China trade negotiations factor into to this? That a lot of what the U.S. and the, if you look at the last uh, two chapters of your book, um, you would you can argue that the Trump administration is looking for the same things as what you suggest in the book. So how does the discussions between the United States and China kind of figure in market reform in China? Well, I mean, I think it is one of the great ironies that if China did all the things the administration's asking for, getting rid of state subsidies, uh, uh, opening up the economy to more to the external forces, et cetera, that they'd probably grow faster. So those people in Washington and elsewhere who think that China's this huge strategic competitor, this would arrive uh, more rapidly. So uh, you know, it's maybe a case of be careful what you ask for. I don't talk specifically about the trade dispute because it's a, it's a rapidly moving story that is not really very well addressed in, the, in a book length uh, uh, treatment. Uh, I can say, however, that I think the slowdown that we have seen uh, since the global financial crisis and even over the last few years is, has very little to do with the trade dispute so far. Uh, if there's not a settlement or if Trump, uh, in the worst case, uh, raises tariffs on uh, some things that are only at 10 percent, I think it will have a negative impact on the economy. But I don't think it's been a big factor in the slowdown so far. China's exports, for example, last year grew at 10 percent, which is a reasonably robust rate, particularly when the global economy is slowing down. So, uh, but, you know, exports in the last couple of months of the year were extremely weak, actually negative, and we see very, very weak export performance in the first two months of this year. So if that story continues, then I think you'd have to come to the view that uh, the trade dispute has had or is having uh, some negative effect on economic growth. Mm -hmm. Can you make the argument that the tariffs actually in the mid and long term will foster reform because they will require China, that, that the, the low value added industries uh, will be required to move out of China more rapidly because of the tariffs and that it will require China to migrate to higher value added where you almost, to have higher value added products, it's almost inconsistent with a statist economy, that you don't get, as you said, you don't get the innovation necessary to move up the value chain unless if you have market reform. And do the tariffs actually make that happen faster? It might accelerate it slightly, but remember the, you know, the moving up the value chain uh, has been going on for some time. Uh, and you could look at the diagram that I just showed you. It's also in the book. You know, state companies which are not very productive, uh, you know, their share of exports has gone from 70 percent down to 10 percent, and private companies have become the dominant source of export growth. So I think in the private sector, uh, that's where the innovation is occurring, and uh, also, of course, in foreign firms uh, as well. And so, you know, at the margin, tariffs could accelerate this moving out of more labor-intensive uh, activity, but I think a much bigger driver is the pretty rapid growth of wages over the last 10 years. Right. Wages have gone up quite a bit, so a lot of the more labor-intensive stuff has already moved out. You know, uh, inexpensive 
clothing and footwear, you know, China used to be providing 70, 80 percent of global, of, of those products in global trade. And now it's declined, I don't know exactly what the number is, but something like 10 or 20 percent. So a lot of that stuff has moved. Uh, if you had tariffs, it would probably accelerate it, but I think the main factor is probably rapidly rising wages. How do you explain the third plenum document, the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress document, which, how do you produce a document that, you know, is adopted by the Chinese Communist Party and then is more or less abandoned um, for six years? <sighs> How, how does that work? How do people sign off on something and then ultimately just not, not do? What happened? Well, I think this is one of the big unexplained things. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, Xi Jinping was party secretary in two very, very market-oriented provinces that had very little state industry. Uh, then he came to Beijing and people assumed once he had endorsed this document <coughs> that he really understood the role of the private sector and how important it was for China's economic growth. But he didn't act on it um, beyond producing the document or at least approving the document. And I, c I cannot, ac I don't have a good explanation. As I said, I think his attention shifted to his anti corruption campaign. And also the other factor. But anti corruption, I don't know, anti corruption, the real answer to anti corruption is market reform. <laughs> to the extent that you don't, you have a state driven economy. The opportunity for corruption I, is enormous. To I, the extent it's market making the determination, it's not easy to have corruption. I agree. I couldn't agree more. Uh, particularly when you look at these uh, 100 companies, you know, that have uh, massive amounts of assets, hundreds of subsidiaries, uh, the, you know, the opportunity for corruption is immense. Uh, there's very little transparency. There's lots of inter-firm transactions. There's lots of no-bid contracts. So it's, uh, you know, as you say, it's really creating an environment that's conducive to corruption. So he's kind of fighting uh, an uphill battle. So I guess, you know, the, the answer that some people give, of course, that he's getting rid of his political enemies through anti-corruption. Um, but anyway, the short answer is I don't know why he turned away from this. Um, and it's very difficult to explain because the belief that the State companies are so important for control. Uh, the data is in the book, but remember, state companies across industry and services only employ 10 percent of the workforce. So it's you know the the old days when you know back in the Zhu and Ji <coughs> downsizing, state companies provided almost half of all the employment. It's only 10 percent today, so. Uh, I, I don't know. Is it pa patronage? Um, it's hard to see exactly how having a big inefficient state, se at least to me, but I'm an economist, so uh, polit politicians <laughs> may see this very differently, but I don't see exactly why <coughs> having a big inefficient state sector that only employs 10 percent of the workforce is uh, such a strong component of, of uh, control. Have you heard from people in China about the book? Well, without mentioning a name, um, you know this person um, came up to me at a meeting in New York not so long ago and said, Nick, this is very important. You can say these things. We can't. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that, that was going to be. How do you square? And by the way, my previous five books on the Chinese economy have all been translated completely into Chinese. Um, um, our publications department has asked several uh, Cidic Press, China Development Press, that have published my previous books whether they want to do a translation of this, and so far they haven't answered. <laughs> really? Because that, that, that kind of flows into the next question, which is, I mean, you know a lot of the economic leadership of China. You've known them for many, many years. How do you square the current policies with these people's views? I think the only answer is they've been sidelined. And uh, you can see it in the frustration when you discuss things with them in private. You can see it publicly, like Lo Ji Wei, who many of right. us have known for decades, one of the strongest reformers uh, and very, uh, maybe excessively for China, excessively candid uh, after <laughs> a number of um, 
strong statements. He was basically forced out of the position of Minister of Finance, uh, what, three years ago? Something like that. Yeah. Now he's head of the Social Security Administration. But on the sidelines of the, and I think he's a member of the CPPCC, the Chinese People's Political Consultative <laughs> Conference. I have to say it fast, otherwise I get it wrong. Um, he said, or at least he was quoted even in the Western press, as being very, very critical of China's industrial policy, saying the state should not identify the dynamic components of growth should be up to the market and the program, and he was just speaking specifically of Made in China 2025, is leading to a massive waste of resources. They've so been a few of them, a few of them, brave ones like uh, Lo Jiwei, who they can't do too much more to hurt him unless they want to put him in jail, uh, still are speaking out, but most are not. And they're sidelined by one person, effectively, by the leader. Yeah. You know, you know, these are the same people that are not happy with the revision of the Constitution so that, uh, you know, she can remain president beyond two terms. Uh, but, you know, nobody wants to stand up and talk about that very openly. But your, your book is somewhat optimistic that, that the things will move back to the 35 years of reform rather than the five years of rolling back reform? Well, I say it could. And, you know, I'm, my basic view is on the current path, growth is likely to slow down a bit over the years. And maybe if growth gets slow enough, Xi Jinping will recalibrate his policies. I mean, after all, uh, the party stays in power from its ability to deliver rising living right. standards, better education, health care, pensions and so forth and so on, and as growth slows down, their ability to deliver those things uh, diminishes. And um, that, you know, that could under, you know, undermine uh, support for the party, and so maybe if growth slows down sufficiently, he will recalibrate and decide to go back to the more yep. market-oriented reforms that serve the country so well for basically 35 years. That's one possibility. The other possibility is he's going to do this in response to external pressure. I think that's much less likely. Yeah, what about the, the one friend who occupied a senior position in the economic leadership, he's now retired, noted my 38 years of optimism and my two years now of pessimism <laughs> about China's economy. And, he, and it's funny, he says, you know, you've been an optimist your whole 40 years with China, you're way too pessimistic. By the way, he said you're way too pessimistic because I, I think these policies are, are, are just disastrous for China in the long term, um, even in the short term now. Um, and he said because when the data, he says that the folks in the leadership are well trained and they really do know how to read data and they do get the data and they do understand what's going on and when it is clear that the data is showing them how far off course they've gone, they will begin to move this tanker back in the right direction. And he says, and that's what 40 years of reform and opening have taught you. The leadership does get it, and the people we know who do surround the president will um, have these changes and will implement, it. will persuade the president to implement these changes when kind of the data shows it needs to be done. Well, I hope this, I hope this is correct, but I, I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it. I think, <laughs> I think the, you know, well, we've just seen 12 years of data on the declining productivity of the biggest state enterprises. I mean, how much more do you need? And furthermore, I think an, another factor that I haven't mentioned, is, or I did mention, the centralization of power the creation of more and more leading groups in all the different domains, all of which are chaired by Xi Jinping, he's now spread very, very thin. Everything comes to him for a decision. Right. Maybe he doesn't have uh, enough time to really focus on what's been happening on the econ economic front. Maybe he doesn't really understand the price <coughs> that's being paid. And furthermore, maybe the people around him aren't willing to tell him. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm not asserting that, but you know, some of the so-called reformers, particularly at the very top, uh, maybe aren't quite as courageous as your interlocutor suggests. <laughs> Nick. Um, Platt. Bring us up to date on 
the share that the private sector has of the economy. You've mentioned that 90% of the hiring is done by them. What are some other major statistics in terms of the share? Well, uh, it's very, uh, I mean, the most important statistic would be what share of GDP is being produced by the private sector. Um, I estimated uh, in a previous book that it was up around 70, maybe as much as 75 percent. So that's going from basically zero in the late 70s up to three quarters uh, or thereabouts. Now, Guo Xuqing, who's the, he's head of the Banking, Regu Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission now, Guo Xuqing last week said uh, yes. it's 60 percent. Oh, a number of people in China have said the private sector is producing 60 percent of GDP. I don't know if that's just a number that they pull out of the air. Uh, I think that's likely to be low. Uh, I don't think the private share of contribution to GDP has gone down dramatically over the last five years. It's no longer growing. But it's probably, it's probably in the neighborhood of two-thirds. So it's very important. If you, and you know it has is far more productive, and you give more and more resources to the least efficient part of your economy. It, you know you shouldn't be surprised when it slows down. What, what do you think the real growth rate is now? What do I think the real growth rate is? I think it's reasonably close to the official data. I would not defend anything to the right of the decimal place. Um, but when they say 6.6, .6, I think it's probably growing something in the neighborhood of six. And I have no patience with people who tell us it's growing at 2 or that recent Chinese economist who said it was growing at 2.67. Anybody who gives a GDP growth rate <laughs> for any economy to the nearest hundredth has lost all credibility regardless of what particular <laughs> numbers <laughs> are in that, uh, in that position. I, um, the reason I say that it's probably in, the neighbor in, that, in that neighborhood, I always do just a quick reality check. China's imports last year, measured in dollars, went up 15 percent. And when I talk to these people that say it's growing at some low double, you know, low single-digit rate, I say, show me any other economy in the world in the last several decades that has had a combination of 15 percent growth of imports and a two or three or four percent rate of GDP growth in every economy, including China's. The growth of imports is primarily a function of the growth of income, national income, uh, personal income, which is closely related. So you're not going to have import growth of, of 15 percent if your economy, you know, there are other things that affect import growth, the exchange rate and, you know, global prices and, a few, you know, you have to qualify it a little <coughs> bit, but you're not going to find an economy with 15 percent growth of imports. Now, the next counter argument that I get on that is, of course, oh, the imports are overstated, it's misinvoicing, people are using this to move money offshore, et cetera, et cetera. But everybody who's ever done the math and has tried to calibrate what China's reporting as imports versus what its trading partners are reporting as exports to China comes up with the view that the Chinese import data are probably pretty accurate. There are leads and lags, there are valuation issues, CIF, FOB, all these things you have to fiddle around with. But <coughs> this to me suggests, you know, remember the Chinese Cust General Administration of Customs is an agency that is centrally controlled. It's been around for decades, unlike every other part of the government that's been reorganized every few years. They've been around for decades. It's centrally controlled. They're, uh, measuring uh, trade at a handful of ports. Uh, all they've got to do is get the dollar value. You know, measuring GDP is very complicated. You know, what's the imputed value of you know, housing rent and, uh, you know, how much is quality changed on your uh, iPad or your phone that you've got to take into account when you're trying mm -hmm. to measure real growth. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I don't think that the import growth is substantially overstated. Uh, you know, when you have two, more than $2 trillion a year in imports, if all of a sudden you're getting crates of the same good and it's priced at, you know, 50 percent more than it was last year or last month, I think it's, it's not that hard to detect. So th anyway, that's my ballpark view on the growth. I think it's probably fairly close to the official numbers. Mm. Sue, did you have something? 
No. no. The um, wh what are the chair? What? Oh. <laughs> um, I, I'm just wondering if in any of this, uh, from what you said, I think I know the answer, but um, is there much conversation about sustainable growth and growth in relationship? You know, needing to slow down um, in relationship to climate or energy uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, well, you know, I, I would say if you're looking out five or ten years, probably uh, climate change isn't going to be a big enough a factor to affect the growth rate. Over a longer period, yes. And energy efficiency is improving, uh, in part because the service sector has become much more important. I mean, if you follow what the brokerage houses are putting out on China, they always focus on industrial growth because they get the high frequency data, they get the monthly data on output. And, you know, that's important, but manufacturing are, are these PMIs that everyone's looking at, PMIs for, for manufacturing. Manufacturing is only a third of the economy today. A uh, little over 50 percent is services, education, health care, entertainment, finance. These are not sectors that are very energy intensive, indeed quite the opposite. Business and leasing services, uh, IT telecommunications, uh, for the most part, these sectors are much less energy intensive. So if you look at the data on energy utilized or, uh, per unit of GDP, GDP produced, it's coming down uh, significantly. Now, and they, they're making progress on moving away from coal, but they started with such a high share that there's still, still a long way to go. But the fact that they're using less <laughs> energy per unit of GDP is at least they're directionally moving in the right way. Jonathan. Yep, appreciate the remarks, by the way, and the fact-based approach. It's, it's actually great to have that all in one place. Or, you know, really, really do appreciate it. I wish I understood or we understood better what led Xi Jinping to, to actually roll back the reforms. Obviously, it wasn't for economic reasons, and I think if we understood that a little bit better, we'd know whether or not there's some optimism uh, you know, to understand when it might turn back. The question I've got is, what about the private firms that have been so explosive within China, I'm talking about Alibaba and Tencent, that basically took these incredibly inefficient you know, industries and you know, disrupted them massively. By the way, these are industries that have huge state-owned enterprises. Right. You know, and um, you know, so, so what do you think the prospects are you know, for companies like that, particularly vis-a-vis the government, particularly vis-a-vis -vis regulation? How, how do we look at that? Well, um, I, I agree with your observation. I would say uh, a couple of things. First of all, how have these companies grown so rapidly? Well, you know, they did IPOs in the global market, and, you know, Alibaba is not knocking on the door of ICBC for a loan. They raised $25 billion <laughs> offshore, and I, I, have, I don't look at their financial statements, but what are they doing with the money? They're putting it into VC vehicles that are, you know, buying up other companies that might be of interest to them eventually that they might acquire. Mm -hmm. So they don't lack, they don't lack for uh, resources. And a lot of the other tech companies are like that. And the VC industry is not huge, but it has grown fairly rapidly. So that part of the private economy is still, at least as best I can figure out, is still doing uh, reasonably well despite the shrinkage of credit generally to the private sector. You know, most private firms are small companies we've never heard of. There are tens, well, there are about 10 million of them. So, you know, if we went around the table, we'd probably get up to maybe 50 names. <laughs> so uh, I think those are the ones that are adversely affected, for example, by the, sl the slowdown and now the squeeze on microfinance or P2P uh, lending. So that's, that's the first thing. So I don't think we should extrapolate from the wild success of the uh, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu to, to the private sector more generally. I think these companies uh, I think they're extremely important. I think they're very innovative. Uh, I mean, the Huawei is probably another one, uh, but I don't think they're representative of what's, of what's going on in the private sector. Now, um, obviously, private companies are also affect. You know, they have to have party committees now. That was something that started 10, 15 years ago, and then it seemed to fade away, right. and now it's come back very strong. So I think maybe this is one of the factors that. Uh, discourages 
uh, entrepreneurs from investing in their businesses. You know, if you're going to have to have a party committee looking over your shoulder all the time, uh, maybe it's time to move your money offshore or do something else. Uh, but I, I'm not, you know, since I live in Washington, I'm not sure how different this is because um, uh, as some of you know, uh, Barbara and I lived in Seattle for a number of years and I met Bill Gates before he ever did an IPO and I knew his mother and his father and uh, mm -hmm. saw them at football games and so forth. And I remember talking to him and he said, we will never, ever have a government office, a, a government representative office in Washington. <laughs> we don't have anything to do <coughs> with the government, and they don't have anything to do with us. Well, you know, now the <laughs> now they're like all these other big firms. They're hiring scads of people in government relations, <laughs> and they're very concerned about. You know, and of course, Facebook is the poster child. Very concerned about how, how the regulatory environment will affect them so obviously they're moving heaven and earth to move things in what they think is the right the right direction and I think private firms in China are in a similar position if somebody calls up Jack Ma and asks him to do something he's probably probably gonna do it <laughs> uh, so I mean some people carry this to an extreme and say well there's really no such thing as a private company in China because the tentacles of the party are are everywhere um, Maybe, but you've got to explain that diagram to me that shows p private companies going like this and, st and state there is a difference in the way they operate. Hmm. Morris. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed you mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative just once, um, and it does seem a political rather than a any sort of productive use of assets. Uh, the projects, some of the projects seem bizarre beyond belief, and I, I wonder if a lot of the material that we're thinking about is really political rather than uh, 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 economic. Uh, they're thinking politically uh, rather than economically. Well, I, th I think that's consistent with what I said. I think as when I said Xi Jinping has really seized these activities as enhancing political control, and obviously the Belt and Road is, is uh, you know, an international extension of that. Um, so, and it, the Belt and Road could be playing into these numbers on lending to state companies uh, because, you know, every time I hear somebody say the Belt and Road is Chinese investment, I say, no, no, it's not investment, it's lending. <laughs> it's not the same. Uh, so maybe some of this growth in lending to state companies reflects financing of, you know, there are 10 big uh, engineering and construction companies that are involved in most of these projects, they have very, very highly leveraged balance sheets. Uh, uh, which does seem like a productive use of their, yeah. of their capital at all. I mean, some of these projects are really bizarre beyond belief. In Ethiopia and other places, I mean, it's just... And again, that, that is also coming in for some criticism domestically. There are people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on, I, only Lodi Wei that I know of is criticizing uh, China's in, internal uh, industrial yeah. policy, but I think there's a broader group of people who are questioning whether or not China should be lending all this money for projects, uh, Belt and Road projects. Um, and as I say, they're, they're, not, they're not investing, they're lending, and there's a whole question of this, you know, how many of these, uh, what share of these loans are ever going to be repaid? Are there going to be defaults? And uh, here's where I part company from some of the criticism. I, I, I would be prepared to believe that the Chinese don't mind controlling that port in um, Sri Lanka. But this idea that they're trying to get all these countries, you know, that this is a debt trap and everyone's going to default and China's going to take over the assets. I don't think China wants to own most of these assets. Who wants to own an electric power generation facility in Pakistan, which is like India? You know, about half the power is drained off. Uh, and not paid for, you couldn't possibly make any money uh, running that kind of a facility. So I don't think, I don't think, in, I don't share the view that some people have advanced that this Belt and Road is really a debt trap, and China is trying to get control of all these assets in uh, across the whatever it is, 80 countries or so. That yeah, that the, ad the administration also misstates a lot of the, the basis for the loan agreements that, you know. What was the country um, where they said that they would take over the electric company if there was default? 
The only problem was when you looked at the underlying loan agreement, it's not what it said. And they said there was a 10 billion of debt, and in fact it was 3.1 billion. It's just part of the mischaracterization of BRI that occurs in, in our country. Uh, the one thing that is similar, of course, is the Belt and Road Initiative was, uh, has been widely identified with Xi Jinping, and there's the speech he supposedly made back in 2013, I haven't gone back and checked it, uh, you know, that they say was the beginning. So, and then when it gets publicized, it's like a campaign. It's like the Great Leap Forward or something. Once, once the top guy says, this is our priority, everybody has to demonstrate that all of their projects and all of their plans are tied into the, to the Belt and Road. And it does become a campaign and kind of more systematic project evaluation or whatever you want to call it, it seems to go out the window because you're really trying to please the master and if the returns are low, you're probably not going to have any adverse consequences. What's going to happen, the Chinese are, are saying and the U.S. is saying that we're going to see a major opening in financial services within China to, the, to foreign investors, that in the commercial banking area, the investment banking area, the insurance area, potentially even accounting and legal and consulting, <coughs> we're going to see <coughs> much greater opening. What's that going to mean for economic reform? I think uh, <coughs> while you and I have said they didn't really do much on economic reform after 2013, I think the, to the extent to which there is an exception, it is in finance. They have done, you know, they've made the exchange rate a little more flexible. They've introduced, they've gotten rid of some of the constraints on interest rates. They've introduced deposit insurance and a few other things. And now they really are opening up and there are a whole series of uh, initiatives that have taken place. Uh, HSBC now has a majority-owned securities firm. Uh, uh, Mr. Greenberg Sorry. managed to increase its ownership in their joint venture uh, uh, you know, substantially with, and w seems to have a commitment to move ahead so that the life insurance part of it will be uh, majority-owned by Chubb. And that would be a breakthrough. AXA has made progress mm -hmm. on, on their insurance uh, activities. So I think in securities and asset management and insurance, uh, the reform is very real. I mean, after all, remember, it was initially announced back in 2017, but, you know, the implementation of it was fairly slow. But I think starting over the summer, they accelerated that. Uh, and I think it's quite real. I mean, the other area is uh, automobile manufacture, where they've gotten rid of the requirement for a 50-50 joint venture. Tesla's now got a 100% uh, foreign-owned company. And that uh, possible, you know, BMW is uh, an agreement to buy down uh, the share of their uh, partner so that BMW will own 75%. I think um, the, the Chinese have forecast that by 2021, you can have a wholly owned, uh, a wholly foreign owned company for commercial vehicles, and by 2022, for, for ordinary cars and SUVs and so forth. So it's, it's moving in the right direction. I think there will be a substantial amount of additional foreign investment in the financial sector. I, I'm not so sure about banking, but I think in insurance and securities and asset management, there'll be quite a bit more. What does that mean then for reform? What does it mean, in other words, especially in the financial service area where the, the private sector can then allocate capital based upon market analysis. It, it will help, but remember, even after foreign firms expand in these domains, it remains a bank-dominated financial system. And, you know, the foreign share of, of bank assets is, you know, has, has been for 20 years at 2% or slightly less. I don't think that's going to increase very much. A lot of the foreign banks that are there, uh, you know, pr primarily want to serve their uh, multinational uh, customers. Uh, with the exception of a couple banks, they're not anxious to go into the retail banking business. It's extremely competitive. Uh, so it may not change so much in terms of uh, addressing this problem of massive misallocation of resources. I mean, at the margin, it'll be positive, but I, I'm a little skeptical it will be transformative. So at the time of China's WTO accession now, 18 years ago, we had predicted, or the, the folks who had negotiated that accession had predicted, that the financial services uh, sector, that 10% of it, 
would be owned by foreigners, assuming that China lived up to its commitments. Obviously, it, it didn't really happen. If that happens now, you don't think they're going to get then to 10%. The market has matured. The state-owned sector has become better at providing services. So it's not going to get there. Well, I... I mean, 10% would be mature. Um, I mean, first of all, in the, uh, I, I was talking to people in Treasury that were negotiating back uh, when China was coming into the WTO. They did not negotiate very aggressively. Uh, and quite frankly, the reason was there they wanted to be able, they, they were worried that China was going to ask for reciprocal, re reciprocal concessions in the U.S. market. So they were not very demanding in terms of, there was no agreement to a lot in the WTO accession to go to majority ownership. And remember, even the early movers like uh, CICC, that you know Morgan Stanley, they only owned 37 and a half percent, and they never really got control. So um, I, I think I think the Chinese got something of a free pass on uh, the financial services part of their of their WTO accession. They were thinking, oh, they were worried about in 2001. They were worried that the Bank of China or the other would be able to compete <laughs> with U.S. banks in the United States. Well, uh, they didn't want to have to give them licenses for, you know, for <coughs> I think mostly not for competitive reasons, but for prudential reasons. I mean, the Chinese banks were, uh, at that time, remember, s s slightly insolvent. Uh, <laughs> so it, they didn't, they didn't, they thought it was a prudential uh, constraint. They weren't worried that ICBC was going to take over the, a significant uh, market share in the U.S. What do you worry about? What, what, what is the biggest worry in terms of the Chinese economy? Not, we'll see gradual slowing. I believe without the market reforms, we're going to see continued gradual slowing. What's the concern? What would create something where the Chinese economy would go off? where we really would see um, not, not slowing growth, but, but uh, potentially even contraction. As we've seen, I mean, I laugh when I hear about the automotive sector, suddenly you can own it. Well, the automotive sector is not growing slowly, it's contracting. So if the, is it possible that's going to happen in the Chinese economy, and what would cause it? Um, I think, quite frankly, the greatest risk is, um, you know, what I would call decoupling. I, you know, there is a segment of policymakers in Washington who want the negotiations with China to fail, uh, so they can claim that China wasn't able or willing to make the kinds of reforms that are required. Uh, they want to see the tariffs stay in place. They want to have more restrictions on exports, and they've got the platform to do that now that the, the that bill was passed and signed into law last summer, which has the potential for substantially tightening up controls on exports of high technology and also making it even more restrictive for China to, um, uh, you know, uh, take over, uh, purchase uh, U U.S. companies. Uh, maybe if things go badly, Mr. Trump will assign that long anticipated uh, presidential directive that Huawei is to be completely excluded from the U.S. market. It's, all, it's basically already excluded for the most important part of the market, but the, you know, there's some smaller telephone uh, communications companies that are using Huawei equipment, particularly in the rural areas of the Midwest and so forth. Um, you know, we saw what was happening to ZTE when they were cut off. So if you would cut off Huawei and ZTE and so forth, I think this would have and, and you don't allow much trade, trade shrinks, um, tariffs not only stay on but perhaps go up. You know, the part that's now at 10 percent goes up to 25 percent. The 200 and whatever, uh, almost 300 billion of, of imports that has no tariffs also goes to 10 or 25. I think that would put a huge dent in the Chinese economy. It would have a very large direct effect uh, for obvious reasons and it would have a very large indirect effect because remember, even though the share of private investment is declining, it's still quite large, and it you know it depends on confidence and some sense of uh, w what the future holds. And if you have a U.S. pursuing this Cold War decoupling strategy, I think private investment in many sectors in China would shrink. So that could that could put a huge dent in their economic growth. So I think uh, what I would say is the the event that could lead to this outcome would be more likely external rather than, than internal.
because internally I am continued, uh, of a continuing of the view that they have very strong growth of consumption. Uh, China is the only major economy in the world where the wage share of GDP is going up. Uh, I think that's likely to continue. You know, OECD countries, it's bouncing along, going down a little bit here, and it depends on what time period you look at. You know, but the labor force, uh, uh, working age population is slowly, uh, so far, shrinking. And as I mentioned before, the service sector is becoming bigger. It's more labor intensive, so the demand for labor is going up and the supply is going down. And uh, I, so I think wage growth will continue to be reasonably strong. And as we saw in the last few years, consumption is the major contributor to growth. You know, it used to be exports and investment, but last year, 76% of the expansion of the economy was due to increased consumption. So yes, things will slow down uh, as a result of all the things we've been talking about, but holding it up from a complete collapse is this relatively strong growth of consumption. What is she afraid of? He's well, clearly afraid of something. I, I, what do you think? I agree and I say, uh, you know, I, I repeat the conventional wisdom that he's the strongest leader since Deng Xiaoping and maybe since Mao. Uh, and I say in the book, well, maybe the, maybe the conventional wisdom's wrong. If he won't undertake a reform that only would impact 10% of the labor force, maybe things are more fragile than we can perceive from the outside. I, I'm not saying they are fragile, but as you look for explanations, uh, that's one that you have to entertain. Marco. Well, that leads me to a second question. I was going to start with something else, but we seem very afraid of China and we being both the United States and Europe and other parts of the world, partly because it's the second biggest economy in the world and it's getting bigger and it's going to overtake the universe. If one accepts that, then could it be argued that China's economic slowdown, however much it is, is actually a good thing, particularly for China's neighbors that seem very fearful of what China's up to. Well, I think this relates to my earlier comment that it's ironic that if China did all the things the government, U.S. government is asking for, they'd probably grow faster. So. Uh, but with respect to the second part of your question, I think if China does consider to slow down, continue to slow down, that the adverse effects are felt particularly by China's neighbors because these are the economies that are most closely integrated into China. The IMF estimates that for every one percentage point decline in China's growth, that global growth slows down by one-tenth of a percentage point. You know, that's not surprising because China accounts for about 15 percent of global GDP, and in recent years it's accounted for about a third of the growth of global GDP. But that adverse effect is not distributed equally. The, you know, the impact in Africa and South America is probably teeny, and the impact in East Asia would be very large, probably three or four times the, because these are the company, uh, excuse me, the countries that are most cl closely integrated. You know, they're supplying the inputs to China's exports. You know, uh, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, and so forth uh, depend very, very much on China's growth and, and particularly its trade growth. So China slows down, those, co those companies will be uh, adversely affected. Tom. Uh, two real, sort of related questions. One was, I remember hearing years ago that the benchmark 7% growth for political stability in China was more or less the mark. But you seem to be as saying that she, for the purpose of control, is actually lowering, you know, it, it, not intentionally, but growth is getting lower than that. And I was just wondering at what point uh, that becomes dangerous from, from a political control point of view. And secondly, um, is there any relationship between the anti-corruption campaign, which I imagine would make you a lot of enemies, and an increased need for control? Well, I think on the first uh, question, we don't really know what the, you know, what's the tipping point? How much would growth have to slow before uh, 
she might reevaluate the, the current trajectory. Um, and yes, people have suggested various points, seven percent or six and a half, and so forth. But I don't. Everyone's. I think everyone's that's throwing out those numbers is more or less guessing. Um, and I don't. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But I think if growth starts going down towards five, uh, that they'll be under a lot more pressure to do something. But remember, keep in mind, if they start going back to a more market-oriented economy, growth will probably slow in the short run. If you have to force some of these companies into bank, oh, there's a very interesting table in the book. Forty-three percent of Chinese state companies lose money. <laughs> this is according to the data from the Ministry of Finance, <laughs> which presumably is in a position to know. <laughs> um, so you, you will have some transitional increase in unemployment. The private sector, I think, is fully capable of eventually reabsorbing people that would lose jobs in the state sector. But there's frictions, and so you could, you know, growth will slow down maybe for several quarters. So that complicates Xi Jinping's calculation. He has to think about, you know, not just what's the tipping point, but, you know, how much more will growth slow down if I actually start going back towards the market economy. So anyway, I think it's a, a very tough question. Um, does the anti-corruption campaign increase the need for political control? Um, I'm, I'm an economist, not a political <laughs> scientist, so I, I'm not sure I have a, a confident, uh, confident answer. I think, I mean, the, the simple explanation would be that she thinks it increases his political power because he's getting rid of potential uh, opposition. Not entirely. I think many of the people that were taken down probably were corrupt. Uh, but I think several people have pointed out that none of his most immediate political supporters have been subject to the anti-corruption campaign. And I'm sure if you dig deeply, you'd probably find uh, some corruption in those families as well. <laughs> no internal black swans? Um, well, you know, what if, yeah, you could, you could paint a, a very negative scenario surrounding the succession campaign that might emerge in three or four more years. Who's, who's uh, you know, it, the decision making about whether or not she stays on for uh, beyond the second term is what probably going to be decided by uh, the Politburo or the Politburo Standing Committee. And if there's a division there, you know, that could spill over and, and create a lot of, uh, a, a lot of short term uncertainty. That would be, wouldn't that be the most likely scenario? Uh, the black swan I always worry about is kind of corruption that leads to a mass incident that, you know, if you looked at the high-speed rail, for instance, where early on corruption in the signaling system led to an accident where a few people were killed. But it was corruption, and we saw in the, uh, the Sichuan earthquake Corruption led to the death of thousands of children, and it required the Chinese Communist Party to really tamp down very strongly on the parents' dissent, <coughs> and that allowed kind of for people to move forward. That the party did an investigation that if you had this building across the street fell and ours stayed. It was because that one, the cement, there was enough corruption, the cement wasn't up to code, the earthquake hit, and the building collapsed with the kids in it. That I mean, was, a hor it was a horrible event, but what I think about is there, there are facilities in China, the power plants, others, where if there were corruption in it and it wasn't built to code, the possibility of uh, an incident, not where it's thousands, but where it's hundreds of thousands or potentially millions. We saw uh, the release, uh, where was it, up in, the, up in the northeast, we saw a, a, a chemical plant just release into the water and poison the drinking water, what was it, Harbin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, for Harbin for a few weeks. So we see these things occur and they're pretty much all related to corruption. And the black swan that I always think about is, what if something like that happens? That corruption that's basically allowed for a systemic fault 
in something to then affect uh, hundreds of thousands of those. And what would that ultimately do to the economy? Yeah, well. But then you need, a you need a political scientist for that one. It's, 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 uh, it's something we don't, we don't talk about, mm -hmm. but it's, it burns. Elena, sorry. There was an article in the New York Times the other day, uh, a private entrepreneur writing why I'm leaving China or why. Right. Um, would you see that this is a, a trend that's serious enough, um, or it's going to be a minority? Economy? There's a lot of, you hear a lot of people are trying to hedge their bets and move their money outside of China, uh, get their families outside of China, but I don't know the extent to what that, how that might affect the Well, um, you know, there's been plenty of wealth diversification for decades in China. The people mo moving some or part of their money offshore. Uh, is it getting worse or could it get worse? I think what we saw back in 2015-16 is they put a lot more restrictions on, mm -hmm. on capital outflows and stabilized the foreign exchange reserves, which had been plummeting. So, if you look at that experience, it seems like they have the mechanisms to to slow that down. But I do think, as I said before, the underlying problem is the protection of private property rights. Mm -hmm. And they have, you know, the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee has put out documents calling for increased protection of private property rights. It appears that most of these directives are uh, intended to influence the behavior of, of uh, politicians at the local level who probably are doing most of the most of the bad stuff like expro expropriating uh, the assets of private entrepreneurs so and it's coming up again last year when you know Xi Jinping had to meet with a bunch of private entrepreneurs to try to stem the tide saying you're very important to the economy we're going to make things better for you uh, so I think it is an issue we need to, I'm, I'm sorry, we've actually reached our bewitching hour. In fact, we're over our bewitching hour. Um, but Nick was, have you already signed all the books? No. But, yeah, well, he will stay around and sign the books. And you feel free to ask him a question. But Nick and Barbara, thank you so much for coming up here today. I didn't say it before, we've given it to you. It's a must read, and the exam is Monday.